Okay, hello everybody. Hi there. Welcome to the South East London Folklore Society. We meet on the second Thursday of the month here. So, um, what we're going to do is we're going to have a talk, Debbie, um, on John Martin for an hour or so. Then we'll have a pause for a refreshments and then an opportunity for a Q&A and some parish announcements of what's going on in the next few months or so. So, without further ado, Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Now, John Martin has done many, many, many paintings, and I have not got time to go through them all. So I have done a few little short films on YouTube on various ones that he did, like trilogies. Like he did a trilogy on the flood story, did a trilogy on the judgment story. And I've got some of my bookmarks here at the front that I've got my website on that take you directly there, should you want to look up some more on John Martin. But without further ado, I shall start about him. So, John Martin was born on the 19th of July in 1789, beside the Tyne at East Landlands, just outside the village of Hayden Bridge. And this is a picture of a younger version of him. His mother, Isabella Martin, lived in fear of the Lord, and this is one of her quotes. There was a God to serve and a hell to shun, and that all liars and swearers were burnt in hell with the devil and his angels. So John Martin was brought up with quite a, a religious family background. His father was Fenwick Martin. This is a picture of them in one of their houses. Um, Fenwick Martin, he, um, his wife, Isabella, they actually eloped to Gretna Green because her family did not approve of him. Isabella, the mother, was um, of a sort of middle-class background, whereas Fenwick Martin, John Martin's father, was working class. Uh, between them, they had 13 children, but only five survived. And uh, they were all brought up with the belief that everything had religious connotations. The children were also reared by their grandparents on the father's side, because Fenwick, um, he had to travel around the country a lot doing his work and Isabella was so caught up in her religious mania that sometimes she wasn't seen as quite fit to be um, So Fenwick went from job to job and sometimes was quite out of work. And it was at that point that he started learning to be a swordsman. And he went on and taught fencing and swords fighting to various soldiers around the country. And because of that, he got enlisted in the army. But only three months in, Fenwick Martin was seriously wounded and was pensioned off. Sadly, both parents of John died in 1813. Now, with John, he was the youngest of the five brothers, that, the four brothers that survived out of the 13 children and the one sister. So, John was the youngest, born in 1789. William was born in 1772. Then there was Richard, who became a not very successful poet. His most famous poem was The Last Days of the Antediluvian World. And then there was Jonathan. Which is why there's a lot of confusion about John Martin. Many people seem to think he was the guy that burnt down York Minister, which I will come to later. But it was actually his brother Jonathan, which is quite strange that a family would call one son John and another son Jonathan, but there you go. So uh, Jonathan was the last son. Now I'm going to just do a little... This is one of John Martin's paintings of the paradise of heaven um, and I've only just done a little part of it because it's so huge it's quite hard to see all of it but uh, this is a quote from S.C. Hall the founder of the art journal who wrote about John and his brothers that John possessed the genius that to madness nearly all is allied because John, Jonathan Martin who burnt down York Minster was seen as quite mad his elder brother, William, was seen as quite an eccentric, and his other brother, Richard, was known as a bit of a religious nut, writing with these strange religious poems that nobody read. There was also a sister, Anne, who was to spend much of her life living with John. Uh, she never married. So living in the country obviously inspired the gigantic landscapes that John Martin went on to paint, like this one here. He spent much time wandering the hills and woods around the Tyne and visiting the ruins of Hadrian's Wall, which was not far from where he lived. But the miners scared him, especially the work in the pits, 
They absolutely terrified him. He had a fear of the dark. And once when he was playing <coughs> Blind Man's Bluff with his sister Anne, she had to save him from falling down a mine. He also had a bit of a fear of ghosts and he kept thinking that he was encountering ghosts in the mines because he could hear all these strange noises and see things out of the corner of his eyes. John left school in 1803, determined to become an artist. And because of this, he and his parents moved to Newcastle, which at that time was an up-and-coming town. It was developing and spreading, and his skyline appears in a lot of Martin's future art pieces, which we'll see off as we go along. So this is from a book, Manfred on Jungfrau. John had been making art since he was a young boy. He even made his own mud pigment to paint a picture of the family cat. He felt he learned little from the grammar school he attended and went off to be an apprentice to Leonard Wilson, which lasted just over a year. He left because of this. Um, he left because he felt that he was not expanding or being paid enough. This led to him being called before the guild for breaking his contract, because in them days, once you signed up as an apprentice, you signed up for so many years, but uh, he'd run away. Um, he had to convince the committee that Wilson had not fulfilled his promises to him of better pay, and that Wilson had not treated him well either. But in the, uh, I got to look at some of the uh, legal documents for all this, and Wilson just said that John wanted to learn a certain way and do certain uh, artwork, and Wilson was trying to show him the proper way to do things. The guild took Martin's side and was released from any obligations. John immediately became a student again and started studying under Boniface Musso, who taught him enamel painting, oil study and perspective. During these studies, Musso was offered work in London with his family in the ceramic painting business. And once there, he invited John to join him. They went by boat to the city and it was on board that ship that John was robbed of all his money. And when he disembarked, he got lost in the many streets of London. And to top it all, when he did finally find Musso and the ceramic factory, there was no work for him. So poor old Northerner comes all the way to London and gets robbed. This was the early 1800s and London was the biggest city in the world and expanding at quite a phenomenal rate. This is a picture of William Martin, his elder brother. Martin got to see the city and how overcrowded it was. The streets were too small and he thought that there was a lack of bridges linking the two sides of the city that was split by the Thames. All this had an effect on him and would urge him into a new career later on in his life which we will come to about how he wanted to change London. At this point in his life he still wanted to make his way as an artist. This was a time when galleries were setting up in London, allowing the everyday folk to see the great works of the masters that were usually kept in private collection for the elite's eyes only. Martin was married by this time, and he had wed Susan Garrett, a friend of Charles Musso, uh, the man who brought him here for ceramic painting. He married her in 1809, and she was nine years older than him. They lived in London at 8 Bannock Place, and they had nine children, but only six survived. John's brother William joined them in London. William was caught up in the advances of the scientific world and had become an inventor. He made a couple of machines that got him noticed, a perpetual motion machine which he exhibited at 28, the Haymarket. But again with him, like many inventors of around this time in the 1800s, this perpetual motion machine wasn't seen as a money maker because there was no oil being used or other uh, liquids or ways to make money from them because a perpetual motion machine doesn't cost money to make or need anything to do it. This machine worked on the principles of indoor and outdoor air pressure. A constant draft through a little tube made a ball wobble in perpetual motion. The other machine that William made was a spring weighing machine. And both William and John worked together on ideas and they put their inventions and the art to the recently formed Society of Arts, a new academy promoting fine arts and scientific development. But William was a bit laughed at for some of his eccentric ideas. So he wasn't quite getting the recognition he wanted and it was kind of affecting John's uh, progression into the art world because everyone saw him as the brother of eccentric William. 
It was during this period that John Martin was going from job to job, just like his father before him. He painted still, but not on canvases. He had become a talented glass and ceramic painter, a trend that was quite po popular at the time. And this is a quote from William Berwick, one of the art critics of the time. Glass painting must have surpassed all other branches of art in splendour, as it is capable of producing the most splendid and beautiful effects. And it's uh, quite a shame, there's no um, pictures or any of John Martin's glass artwork left anywhere. It all seems to have disappeared. So, we've got a loss there. This is one of Mar uh, John Martin's major works. It's the Sardak the Wanderer. I don't know if you can see him down here, climbing up the wall. So he, John Martin either painted religious scenes or scenes from books, which this is from, usually romantic images from classical books. He would later become known for his landscape drawings, usually done in a sepia design and for turning literary references into visual reality. One of his first major landscape pieces was this, a scene from James Ridley's Towels of the Genie, written in 1762. So this is the Tower of Sardak, and that's him down the bottom, a Persian nobleman whose wife was kidnapped by the Sultan. To get her back, Sardak was sent by the Sultan to find the waters of oblivion. And here's a quote from the book. After the fatigue and scrambling upwards, he reached a broad, flat, prominent rock whereon he laid his weakened body and looked downward on the waves below. In 1828, Martin did another piece from the same book, this piece called Sardak the Wanderer, which was used as a front piece for uh, Shelley's keepsake. But many people came to see this because no one else had ever painted such a painting like this. It was uh, quite a phenomenon at the time. So another one of his paintings was Clyte. This was in 1814. Clytie fell in love with Apollo and her love was rebuked and she wandered the earth forlorn until Apollo turned her into a sunflower so that she has to look at the sun god forever. The original of this was damaged at the 1814 Royal Academy exhibition. How is unknown, but varnish was poured down it and Martin was adamant it was sabotage and blamed the Academy. He was sure they did not appreciate his art in fact, he was actually sure they opposed his style completely. But because he made such a complaint about it, he didn't get to show at the Royal Academy that much after them because they just saw him as a bit argumentative. This is from Macbeth. And this one, see Macbeth? Macbeth, and then we've got the three witches over here. So, Macbeth meeting the Weird Sisters. This was hung at the British Institute in 1831. Sir Walter Scott was invited to John's studio and he went and saw this being painted and he wanted to buy it, but uh, he didn't quite have enough money. John Michel researched all his paintings, so much so that he checked with his Scottish colleagues what would be the correct tartan for Macbeth and Macduff. And you can't really see it here, but if you get to see the original painting, up close, that part of it is quite, quite different. And again, as usual, the fantastic landscape. And then we've got from King Arthur's story. This is King Arthur, and I never know how to say this, Agiel in the Happy Valley. We've got Arthur here. He loved his moonscapes and his well, landscapes, obviously, which is what he was known for. And there's Manfred on the Jungfrau again. This is Prince Leopold of Saxe Coburg. In 1814, the King of Belgium sent one of his sons to England, Prince Leopold. He was seen as an insignificant member of the royal household and he had to take up lodgings in rooms above a grocer's shop in Marleybone. He actually shared these rooms with John Martin and his family. And this was in the High Street, Marleybone, possibly, we think it's number 75, but someone else told me it was number 73. John and Prince Leopold became firm friends, so much so that John named one of his own sons after him, and Leopold was also the boy's godfather. In 1816, Prince Leopold married Princess Charlotte of England, 
And she was the regent's daughter, and they all lived happily until sadly she died in childbirth. But John Martin became the drawing master to both of them, and after they were married, he was then given the title of historical landscape painter. So he was being, John Martin was being brought into royal circles, and this is how he was beginning to meet all different kinds of people, famous people of the times, and how his name was getting known. When Leopold became uh, king of Belgium, he had one of John Paintings, well, many of John Paintings Martins taken and exhibited in Brussels because they were such good friends. And he also gave John Martin a knighthood, which was a Belgian knighthood, not a, an English one. So this is Joshua commanding the sun, which is another, one of the ones that Prince Leopold took to Brussels. Um, again, this brought many, many people to come and see it. It's a huge, huge giant painting. And John Martin used to write pamphlets for all his big paintings, and some of them were 16 pages long. But I've got a quote for this one. Down to this period, I had supported myself and family by pursuing almost every branch of my profession, teaching, painting small oil pictures, glass enamel paintings, watercolour drawings. In fact, the usual tale of a struggle artist's, artist's life. I had been so successful with my sepia drawings that the Bishop of Salisbury, the tutor of the Princess Charlotte, advised me not to risk my reputation by attempting the large picture of Joshua. Um, many people told him not to do this. Uh, there was quite a lot of critique about his people. He, they didn't think he was uh, very good at doing people, but they loved his landscapes. As you can see, his buildings are just like, fantastic in the background. Just wonderful. And then his people, everyone was saying, weren't that great? The difference between Martin and other artists' paintings, painting this scene, was that Martin concentrated on the elements, whereas other artists would concentrate on the figure of Joshua. And this is a quote from John Martin. The confidence I had in my powers was justified, for the success of my Joshua opened a new era for me. And this did, this really opened him up to the world. People came from all over the country to see this painting. He also went on to make a, a new style of reproduction of his own works, mezzotints, which weren't um, and the mezzotint of this painting was a big seller. Not many people did mezzotints in them days, and it was uh, very hard to get copies of paintings. You had to go to the galleries to see them. This is the fall of Nineveh. It was a few years later that Leopold, the insignificant son who was to become the king of Belgium, who took this painting to Brussels as well, he still favoured John Martin's art, and this was one of Leopold's favourite pieces, The Fall of Nineveh, which Leopold had sent to Brussels where it was displayed at the Salon in 1833. And because of this, Leopold appointed Martin to be a Knight of the Order of Leopold. John's wife Susan insisted on being called Lady Martin after this event. And because um, it was so popular in Brussels, then the English art critics suddenly went, oh, if it's popular by over there, we must show it over here. So they were trying to get it back. Um, but Leopold held on to it for a while. But when it did come here, finally to London, there was apparently queues around the corner. And those, this one for the Welsh. Is anybody from Wales here? The Bard. Another, another of Martin's well-received works was The Bard. This is a scene from Thomas Gray's poem, which was about the Welsh bards who were massacred by the army of Edward I. One bard survives, and he pours curses, chants, and woes down upon the king's troops as they leave the scene. And it's a harlot castle that is depicted. So you've got the druid up here, cursing all the king and his troops that are hidden down there. And I'm sure many of us are druid fans here. So John Martin went on to do mesotints, which was a new thing in these days. In 1818, Martin and his family moved to 30 Allsop Terrace in the New Road, and this is where he lived for the next 30 years of his life. It was whilst he lived here that he was commissioned to draw and engrave views of a house built on the edge of Cotswolds. This is Zezincott. Zezincott was an Anglo-Indian designed country house, and the designer was S.P. Cockerell, and built for Sir Charles Cockerwood, the designer and homeowner being brothers. 
Charles Cockerell had made his uh, fortune out in India, which is why he wanted this, this Indian style. It's like a mogul style. I think I've got another one here of the gardens. And because of this, these two pictures, other people then started commissioning John Martin to come and take measure tints of their houses, like he did the Brighton Pavilion and other lords and ladies buildings that were around the country. So he was again now beginning to move in quite well-known circles and getting a name for himself, even though the RO was still in the main show. This is the fall of Babylon, 1819. So again, we've got the huge uh, towers and the ziggurats and his people. This piece was shown at the British Institute and was one of Martin's more popular pieces. It drew large numbers of people and it also sold well whilst on its exhibition. People loved his cityscapes, even though they were depicting fallen empires. <clears throat> and this picture was probably apt to Londoners because at this time, London was nicknamed the New Babylon. Since like Nebuchadnezzar's city, it was built by foreign and Babylonian architects and was a multinational city, which London was becoming in them days. London was expanding and moving along. It was also getting full of pollution and bad living quarters and overpopulation brought criminal activity, poverty. And so London was beginning to represent the streets of Babylon. And because of this, John Martin started seeing different ways of making London a more livable city. Uh, this is his architectural aspirations. He wanted to rebuild the city, visualising it as you know, a more magnificent, open air, great big streets you know, for people to roam around instead of these dark little alleyways and stark streets where you could get easily mugged as you walk down the road. So it was in 1820 at the Royal Academy exhibited these two pieces, which were different views of a new design he wished to propose for the new road from Portland Place to Regent's Park. So this was spanning the new road, and it would, he says it would give a noble and ample access to London. He would wanted the construction to be made of marble, and he drew up these plans because he wanted to improve the city's water, the city's roadworks and what would then come on to be later, the city train lines. And he did all this because he wanted to do it for the benefit of society. John Martin said to his son, Oh my boy, if only I'd been an engineer. Hundreds of pounds of me would have been thousands. Instead of benefiting myself and only a few, I should have added to the comfort and prosperity and the health of all of mankind in general. So it was about this time that he then also painted this, which was called Marcus Curtius, which is the story of a man, Marcus Curtius, a Roman citizen who offers himself as a sacrifice to the gods by jumping into a chasm that had opened up in the city of Rome. And because he had done that, Rome did not fall. And we kind of feel that John Martin, from his writings, was feeling the same way. He would have given his life to make London a better city and to be more prosperous. Martin wanted to add to London the comfort, the prosperity and health of mankind in general and he believed his visions of rebuilding London and her, and her water supplies would do this. Because at that time, well the Thames was full of pollution and sewage and the streets of London ran full of pollution as well, of sewage. It was lovely. So this is just a bigger picture of of the new road that he was envisioning. In the past, he had worked with his brother William on ideas and inventions, and he had watched his brother William win prizes and medals of achievement from the Society of Arts. So Martin already had experience from working with his brother at drawing plans and assembling systems and mechanical machines. Martin went from painting ancient metropolises to ideas of reconstructions of the metropolis, metropolis of London. He now threw himself into projects to improve the city and went from being an artist to an architect and then to an engineer. He handed all his plans in towards various academies that should be rebuilt in London, like the waterworks, the roadworks, but none of them were quite interested. Many of them seemed to get lost in the paperwork. 
This was a time of great developments. John Martin was up against a lot of competition of other people that wanted to rebuild London. So new cemeteries were being created, new buildings erected. This was the time of Nash, Brunel and Stevenson. And John Martin knew all these people. Martin designed new roads, new embankments, new, in new sewer, in sewer systems, inspired by the same engineers that were given in these same plans. Again. But he also had other ideas, along with his brother William. They made pamphlets advertising their ideas. William Martin had invented a mine ventilation system and a safety lamp for the miners, which was at that time a dangerous occupation. And they both grew up where there was lots of mining going on, having grown up in the north of England, and they knew of many deaths, many deaths in their, not in their families, but in people around them. So it was something that was on their mind for many years. John said of William, my brother is obliged to make use of the talent that is given him the same as myself, as we are sent on earth to enlighten the world, and those talents are not to be hid under a bushel. So this is one of the ventilation lamps that, uh, ventilation systems that William Martin was making. And the person that did go on to make and be credited for ventilation systems is very like what was originally William Martin's plan so a bit of uh, plagiarism may be going on there. William and John both strongly believed that mines should be properly ventilated for the workers, and so the brothers presented a pamphlet entitled, titled Plan for Purifying the Air and Preventing Explosion in Coal Mines, which was another thing that was happening quite a lot. Obviously, there was lots of explosions, and because of that, lots of deaths. In fact, John Martin presented this piece to George Stevenson, but Stevenson did not agree with Martin's concern on the accumulating foul gases and the danger that they would cause. Stevenson was adamant that all the shafts would be properly ventilated by his own system. Another concern of the brothers was the safety lamps, saying that the Davy lamp that most mine owners used was not adequate, and John Martin was accused, along with his brother, of not being a very practical man, though it has been looked at since then, and people have seen that his... Uh, plans, these designs were quite practical. This may be more a case of they didn't know the right people to give them to. William Martin put forward a pattern for a new design for a safety lamp. This too was turned down. So this is the other safety lamp. Oh, that's the same one. So John Martin went on to uh, make a plan for supplying the cities of London and Westminster with pure water. And I've taken these pictures from my book, but I have since found out that someone's actually done a website, um, I found this out the other week, of all John Martin's plans to improve London. Um, and they've, got, they've managed to get the actual designs and the blueprints, which I would love to have a look at. But anyway, they're online on another website. So um, in 1827, John submitted this plan. He said, this plan is to supply in the cities of London and Westminster with pure water from the River Colne. But the water system um, didn't quite fit with what his plan was too ambitious. That's what they were telling him, like the Thames water of them days. They said they could never afford to uh, put all the money in for all he wanted to do. But John Martin never gave up. Every time his plans were rejected, he would revise them and resubmit them. The problem with his ideas were, like his paintings, they were too big, too expensive, and some said impractical. Regarding the water supply from the River Colne, the plan was that either an aqueduct or a tunnel would be built from the River Colne in Denham, which would be transported via a reservoir in Bayswater and then distributed by tunnels around London. Some people added that there would not be enough water in the Colne to do this ambitious task. So Martin revised the plan again calculating the measurements of the water flow and proving that it could be done. But this was still turned down. All these great metropolises are founded on great rivers, so Martin turned to making plans for flood control, which was another worry for Londoners, that the Thames would break its banks and flood the city. And he was saying that his plan, this plan to improve the Thames waterways, would bring in flood banks, where the plans that were being actually used and made in London at that time didn't really consider flood, air, uh, flood banks. 
but that's started happening in the last hundred years. We've started having like the Thames Water Barracks and things like that have been coming up. And uh, I was told that they were quite based, they were based, not properly, but looked at John Martin's plans and used some of them to make them. So it's like John Ma Martin's plans have been finally used many centuries later. He also wanted to redesign the embankment, but at this time, the Thames was the main highway for all import and export, and Martin wanted to redesign the whole of the waterfront, which again would be very expensive. He put forward architectural designs and a new type of water supply with specially built-in sewers. The plans covered the area from Millbank to the Tower. His first embankment design was in 1828 and was of a quay running on columns beside the Thames. Martin wanted to extend the embankment and create, he says, a beautiful calm sheet of water, navigable at all times up to, Tim, up to Teddington. And then he went on to say, and this would be for converting the banks of the Thames into a continued useful range of Doric corridors with walks all over them. So he was trying to make it so that even the people would have lovely pathways and bridges to walk up and down the Thames, because as I said earlier, there was only two bridges at that time. And he wanted to make it more accessible for everybody. He then went on to think of a sewage system, which was, uh, con he continued with his proposals of a sewage system, which involved converting the sewage of London into special channels that would be converted into liquid sewage and sprayed over the fields of Surrey. Most of his plans were declared impractical by the various committees of London, including Metropolis Water, the Thames Navigation Committee at the Institute of British Architects. One of his plans was finally accepted, but it was never fulfilled. He came back with another plan for designing the embankment into a magnificent promenade. And he said, the style of architecture best adapted to my plan is either Tuscan or Doric, but the buildings on and near the public walkways should be suited to locality, for instance, the Corinthian order should be adopted to carry on and compose Somerset House. The western side of Waterloo should be Tuscan, since their noble structure is of that order. And near the House of Parliament, Gothic should be used. Thus, there will be grandeur, simplicity, varied interest, and complete harmony without monotony. There was much opposition to Martin's plans. William Matthews, a representative of the private water companies of that time, said the Lord God had given us humans, and he then went on to say, to have special organs to prevent one from being poisoned with water, because in these days people were dying from all the sewage and the uh, uh, diseases that were coming from it. The improvement of a water and sewer system was causing distress and illness because all this was, quote, an infection of the imagination. So John Martin was trying to tell everyone, no, it's not an infection of the imagination. People are dying from the dirty water. And the Metro Metropolitan Manure and Sewage Company and Parliament commissioned him and the company to build a containing sewer system. But again, there was so much opposition, many arguing that a private company should not be doing the work. Plus, others were against his reusage of sewer as manure for fields and that the plan was not put through which, you know, today, a lot of farms use sewage for manure for their fields. In these days, ship ferrying was the main tra travel way for trade, but there was constant reports of shipwrecks as they crashed on Britain's rocky coasts coming into the Thames. And so John Martin put forward a design for a floating harbour lighthouse, which sadly there's no pictures of, um, and the plans for this have disappeared. Sadly, these designs are nowhere to be found, but they were sent to the admirals and other high-ranking sea officers, as well as Prince Albert, who actually was one of the men that put them forward and said that these would be a good idea, but again, they got lost in the paperwork. Another major problem for seafaring was fire aboard ships. Many lives were lost to these tragedies, and John Martin again put forward designs for fireproof ships. Apparently, these designs were also lost by the authorities um, in their offices, and so the design was never considered. He also went on to uh, make designs for houses for making gunpowder to be stored in a safe way. 
because in them ties again there was problems with gunpowder going off and uh, fires and accidents and he made a four page manuscript designing a suitable house that would be fireproof and safe with special locks on it um, with a, a, a like an agenda of how people should enter it but again these plans were also lost in the offices it's like he, he just wasn't being allowed to show his work Right, so I shall come back to that one. John Martin mixed in many circles, and one of his acquaintances was the civil engineer and mechanical engineer, George Stevenson, who is regarded as the father of the railways. He and his father, Robert Stevenson, went on to build the first steam trains to be used by the public. And probably because he knew them, John Martin himself, in 1845, turned to his ideas to the train system, and he wanted to make a connect, connecting railway and railway transit beyond <coughs> the banks of the Thames. This, was included, this included a later addition of an underground railroad. This was before tubes came along, because he believed in the importance of preserving open grounds in the vicinity of large towns. And, and this was a time when London was becoming a bit more greener. They were investing a lot of money in making parks and walkways and thoroughfares for the peoples, so um, having an underground system would have kept all them. But again, these uh, plans were lost in transit. And this is a map, well this is one of the few plans we still have of, of his map, well, you can't really see it on there. Well, this is a quote from John because none of his proposals were taking off. He was uh, taking solace in writing things like this. In 1832, 1836, 1838, 1842 and 1843, 1845 and 1847, I published and republished additional particulars being so bent upon my object, and I was determined never to abandon it. And though I've reaped no other advantage, I have at least the satisfaction of knowing that the agitation thus kept up constantly, solely by myself, has resulted in a vast alteration in the quantity and quality of the water supplied by the companies, and in the establishment of a board of health, which will, in all probability, eventually carry out most of the objects I have been so long urging, which they did. All these things that he was saying he wanted and all his plans, more or less, were put in to um, F or made, but not in John Martin's name. Another thing that John Martin championed was that technical drawing should be on the school syllabus so that laymen would be taught and learn how to plan and draw for themselves. And it's back in these days also, we think it was probably more of a class, a class war, uh, John Martin being working class, and they gave all these kind of jobs of architects and engineering would be to other classes. In 1824, Martin tried his hand as a businessman and put all his savings into a new bank, Marsh, Sibold and Company. But this bank got involved with all the money laundering that was going on in them days and also there was a man called Lord Faulkner who was part of the money forging business and it was this bank that was handing out all the forged money and because of this it got closed down and John lost all his money. So just John was unlucky in choosing which bank to invest his money in. The 1820s was not a great time for Britain's banks. There had been a boom, but that imploded. And also the problem, as I say, of criminals forging the money, all the new notes that were circulating at the time, made many bank systems fail. But this one, Marsh, Sibbard and Co. took the biggest fall. So instead of painting, he became an engraver, but he did do this painting of pandemonium because, well, he was going for a bit of pandemonium himself of losing all his businesses and none of his architectural ideas or engineering ideas taking off. And this was the first painting he was to do after all these failures. He also did some new prints for Milton's Paradise Lost, which were published by Prowitt and sold so successfully that he could pay for assistance to help him make prints of all his oil paintings. Right, I shall now come on to Jonathan Martin, not John Martin, this is his brother Jonathan. So in 1829, 
John's other brother, Jonathan, got into some trouble. John could paint fantastic storm scenes, whereas his brother Jonathan had dreams about them. Jonathan had become a Wesleyan. He became a preacher and gave many disruptive sermons that often denounced the Church of England. He had a row with the Bishop of Oxford, which ended up with Jonathan threatening to shoot the bishop, which resulted in him being arrested and tried. The conclusion being that he was a bit mad and put into a lunatic asylum. He was released some time later, but the Wesleyan Church wouldn't take him back, and so he moved to York. And it was at York Cathedral that he had another breakdown. The church organ was to him making a buzzing noise which irritated him. So one night, during a heavy storm, this is what he says he was about to do. This is about the storm. The storm rolled over and rested upon the lodgings where I slept at. When I found it came, I awoke, I prayed to the Lord and asked the Lord what it meant. And I was told by the Lord that I was to destroy the cathedral on account of the clergy going to plays and balls and playing at cards and drinking wine. So fulfilling the will of God that old men should see visions and the young men dream dreams and that there should be signs in the heavens, blood and fire and vapour and smoke and so on. And so he then went to the next sermon. He hid in the building after the service. And that night, he set three heaps of wood in an empty cathedral. And the woodwork came from the choir stalls, so he cut all them down. He set fire to them, and then he escaped by climbing the bell ropes and jumping out of the window. This fire burned for 24 hours. He ran away, but he was caught and once again declared insane and sent to Bethlehem Royal Hospital, Bedlam, where he died. Three months later, Jonathan's son Richard killed himself and he had been living with his uncle John Martin and his wife Susan. Richard had also been suffering from mental health issues and the reason he killed himself was because he believed that his own breath was poisoning himself and all the rest of the Martin family and he believed that they would be turned black by him. And this is why people say that there's madness runs in the John Martin family. John Martin knew and met a lot of people and held weekly talks and dinners at homes where scientists, writers, painters, entertainers and such like all came to meet. Turner was a pal, as was Faraday, who championed many of Martin's ideas. Martin met Dickens and knew many historians of the time, and then he met a geologist who was to inspire him to draw beasts of a forgotten age, which these are. That geologist was Dr Gideon Mantell, who had unearthed fossils of the great maidstone Iguardium. And this is the drawings that were used in Mantell's books. Martin drew these and other dragons, and at this time fossil hunting and dinosaurs was the trend running through the UK. And the dinosaurs of the Crystal Palace Park were based on the drawings by John Martin. I don't know if you remember the dinosaurs in Crystal Palace, yeah? So they were all designed from John Martin, though he didn't make them, they were just from his designs. <coughs> some more drawings, just like his dragons. Now this is Belshazzar's feast, which has recently been shown at the National Gallery. I don't know if it is still up there, but it was part of Cole's exhibition. And they wouldn't let me take photos. So this is from a book, which was a bit annoying because to see the picture itself, it has a lot more detail. It's really hard to tell from a picture, photograph from a book. So this is Belshazzar's feast, and this is the painting that brought John Martin back into the world of art and uh, made him a lot of money. And John Martin says of this painting, My picture of Belshazzar's feast was originated in an argument with Alston. He was himself going to paint the subject and was explaining his ideas which appeared to me altogether wrong and I gave my conception. He told me that there was a prize poem at Cambridge written by Mr T.S. Hughes which exactly tallied with my notions and he advised me to read it. I did so and determined on painting this, pa painting this picture. I was strongly dissuaded from this by many, many people. Among others was Leslie, 
who was so entirely different from my notions of the treatment that he called on purpose and spent part of the morning in the vain endeavour of preventing my committing myself and so injuring the reputation I was obtaining. This op op opposition only confirmed my intentions and in 1821 I exhibited the picture. And after all these people telling him not to do it and then him painting it, it was regarded as a phenomenon and it was chosen as picture of the year and by public demand it was kept on exhibition for another three weeks and it also sold whilst on display. John, pa John Martin made a pamphlet instructing the viewer as to how to view the picture, advising that one should start from the brazen serpent, which is on that end. If you can see it here, it might be a bit too dark. Yeah. So he invited, told them to start from the brazen serpent and then to go along the front, then upwards. He commented on the picture saying that it, was, that it was a perspective of light and, if the expression may be allowed, a perspective of feeling. He made copies, including one on, gra on glass, which was shown in a shop near the Strand, where viewers were charged a shilling to come and see it. Oh, that was the quote I just gave you. <clears throat> and this is his drawing of Queen Victoria. The young Queen Victoria was crowned on the 28th of June, 1938, and John Martin was commissioned to make a piece celebrating this very day. And this is his only contemporary piece. Everything else he's done has been biblical stories or pictures from uh, books. Uh, Prince Albert himself used to come and watch Martin work on this. Um, I find it quite strange that he painted them, but he, he never actually painted a picture of his good friend King Leopold, who he named his son after. He then went on to do pictures from Paradise Lost. Uh, so this is Milton's Paradise Lost, which John Martin worked on in 1841, which again was very popular. And because of this, people started forging his work. Um, and he was quite annoyed, obviously, that people were selling fakes of his work. Uh, and this, then he went on to do pictures of the Bible. So this is some of the Bible pictures. And this was the only project of John Martin to fail. Uh, nobody bought his book on the illustrations of the Bible. That's Adam and Eve. But then he went on to do the creation of light. In the beginning was darkness, and then God created light and swept the darkness away. And this inspired Martin to paint. So it's known as the creation of light, but it's also known as the creator. I don't know if you can, can you see him, the creator God, here. Yeah. Because this is one of the things of John Martin's uh, paintings of angels and gods. You have to really look for them. Because most people look at them and think, oh, nice landscape scene. When you look deeply into it, there's God starting the, starting the world, the universe. This is the deluge. This is one of the ones I've done a little film of on um, YouTube because he did three paintings of the deluge, um, all about the sun, the moon, and the comet. Were the reason that, that were the uh, omen saying that the flood was about to start. And then we have the last man. John Martin worked on some paintings from books that were set into the future. This was The Last Man, based on Mary Shelley's book of the same name, published in 1826. And he did two copies of this. I don't know if I've got the oh, That one's a bit out of focus. But this is, again, one of the, this is coming to be the end of his life. This is one of his last paintings, which I think is quite sad, really, that he's doing The Last Man on the Planet. So in his last days, this is the angels guiding paradise at night. From 1848, John Martin began to spend his summers in the Isle of Man. In his last summer there, in 1853, he had a stroke which paralysed his right arm and left him unable to talk. He began to consider his mortality now that he was unable to paint or communicate. He kind of fell into a bit of a depression and after a while he began to refuse food. He wanted to just watch the sea, which he did by day and by night until his death on the 17th of February. He's buried in the Spittle Vault of Kirk Brandon Churchyard. Which, well, that's his uh, drawers. 
where you used to keep his paints and brushes. And this is Kirk Brandon Churchyard. I went there to go and visit him and to go down into the vault. I couldn't believe it, the church was shut for renovation. <laughs> it's like, oh, all the way there. But, um, so that's where he's buried, somewhere in there. And then I just want to finish with one of his masterpieces. This is the city of God and the waters of life. John Martin said, improve your power of action and you improve your condition. The great becomes the gigantic. The wonderful swirls into the sublime. I think that's the last one. Of oh, the destroying angel that I'd put in just for the end. And that's my talk on John Martin. Thank you.